Can priests disobey the Pope? Can priests disobey their bishop? But today on One Peter Five Podcast, we're going to talk about that with Peter Kwasniewski. Stay tuned. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to the One Peter Five Podcast. Rebuilding Christendom, Restoring Catholic Culture and Tradition. I'm Timothy Flanders, the editor of 1 Peter 5, joined today by Dr. Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. Dr. K, how are you doing? Doing well. Thank you, Timothy. Good to see you. Yes, it's always good to talk with you. We're talking about a very important topic, which is Dr. K's new book, which is True Obedience in the Church, A Guide to Discernment in Challenging Times. This book is available for free for priests. Um, Dr. K, can you tell us about that promotion that exists right now for priests? Sure. And in fact, not just for priests, also deacons and seminarians, basically clergy and seminarians. Um, yeah, no, it's just simply a, a, um, a, 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 a gracious benefactor offered to sponsor free copies um, via Sophia Institute Press. So you can, you can get it. You can find out that link at, if you go to this site, trueobedience.com. Uh, and you you can get your free copy there. Excellent. Yep. So trueobedience.com. If you haven't already, uh, you can get a free copy, Clergy and the Seminarians. Um, it is endorsed by many different authors. We've got, oh, it's also in German, too. I didn't realize that, too. And it's Spanish. Verer Gerhorsam in Der <laughs> Kirche. Excellent. Right, That's yes. my choppy German for you. Excellent. Right. Well, let's let's we're going to get into our topic in just a minute. Before I do, I want to remind everyone we are doing our spring fundraiser. We don't want to pester everybody all the time with money. So we are doing a fundraiser twice a year is our plan right now. We are quite behind. We have a significant amount to raise 89 percent total of our fundraising goal. We still need to raise for this spring fundraiser. So Please make a donation. The One Peter Five is crowdfunded, and we need to rebuild our donor base. It is so your donations are tax deductible in the United States. Uh, you can donate at onepeter5.com/donate. You can also donate by check. You can donate by phone. You can donate by cryptocurrency. If you go to onepeter5.com right now, the post explains everything. So please donate. Help us continue to produce this content for free for all. So. 1peter5.com slash donut. Thank you. All right. So let's get into our topic, true obedience. I want to, I wanted to first contextualize this treatise. We were talking before we went on the air today <laughs> about the fact that it, it does seem that this is either, it is either, this is either the first treatise of this kind in this period, or it's just a neglected topic essentially, because we had the situation that arose in the 1960s, really beginning with 1960, like right after actually the, Sacrosanctum Concilium was passed in 63. We were already having a, tons of experimentation that was going on in every parish in the in the Western Rite and the Roman Rite. And we have a, the immediate uh, institution of Una Voce in 1964. Uh, we have SSPX is founded in 1970. We have other groups that are forming that start to resist what is coming out of Rome, what's coming from the local bishop what's being implemented in the Novus Ordo, in the experimented Novus Ordo, then in the real Novus Ordo, we have the suppression of the Latin mass. So we have all these different groups that are that are resisting, disobeying in some, in some sense, and they're doing so for the next 30, 40 years, and they are vilified <laughs> as schismatic, disobedient, unfaithful Catholics uh, for decades. But finally, after some some detours and some gradual implementation with Ecclesia Day FSSP. Finally, there's some more on Pontificum in 2007, mm -hmm. which essentially acts as a vindication of all this disobedience, so-called, which seems to be vindicated by the Holy See on a very principled basis. So now all of these so-called schismatics are vindicated. But now we, we've been put back into the same position now with Traditionis Custodis. And now the, the accusations are coming back again. You're schismatic, you're Lutheran, you're Jansenist, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so now this, would you say, Dr. K, that this treatise, how does this treatise relate to our history and what our forefathers went through with the traditional movement? Yes, I mean, certainly uh, there's nothing... There's nothing in the treatise. In fact, there's almost nothing in my writings that is uh, 
intended to be original, right? I mean, I wouldn't be a very good traditionalist if I was, you know, spinning out new ideas. What I'm trying to do is collect the best thought uh, on all these subjects and give it a new presentation, um, maybe a more convincing or a more succinct presentation, um, give examples, flesh it out in a way that's going to be useful for us right now. Um, so, I mean, really the, the, the question of obedience has been neglected. Um, the, the area in literature that where you see it the most is in books uh, and articles written for religious, you know, who take a vow of obedience. What does that vow mean? Well, those are interesting discussions and, and they come up to a certain extent in this book, at least incidentally. But that's not the main context in which lay people and secular clergy and bishops themselves are dealing with the question of obedience um, to the next highest level of the hierarchy, right? This, the sort of ordinary obedience of Catholic life is something that's been, I would say, kind of taken for granted, mainly because before the Second Vatican Council, we did not have a crisis of obedience and authority to the same extent that we have now. Um, I mean, now it's 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 crazy the extent to which we have this problem. So it's let's say there's a there's an urgent need for a sober clear, orderly, Thomistic treatment of this question. And that's what I've tried to provide. Yes. And this is a, it's really a fantastic little book and, it, and it's great. It's just, it's not a big, huge 500 page thing. It's just a short book that really breaks it down in a very Thomistic sense in terms of uh, really getting to the meat and the heart. Uh, why don't we start with that? Uh, you want to start with that hierarchy to, to start discussing what obedience is? Sure. Um, okay. Sure. So here's the graphic that's in the book. Uh, can you break down what this all means here? Right. So, um, this is found, you know, there's a, there's a full, there's, there's a middle, uh, there, there's a two page spread in, uh, in the book. Um, the quality of the graphics is better in the book. This is just like a, well, like a screen capture basically. Um, but what I, what I explain, uh, following St. Thomas is that there's a hierarchy of authorities. God himself is perfectly holy and true and just and his law his will can never be evil or sinful um, or or distorted or anything so we owe god absolute obedience um and, and that's why for example when he told abraham to offer up his son isaac abraham said yes lord i will do that um god god is the lord of life and death and he and we owe him absolute obedience every created authority uh, that is, every creature who exercises some authority does so by God's leave, by God's grant, um, by God's uh, allowance, and and therefore always in accord with God and his law and his revelation and his will. Um, and so we see that this kind of cascading of authority from God um, you know, through his revelation, what he reveals to us, um, his divine law, the Ten Commandments, for example. Uh, and I say that includes liturgical providence. We can get into that. That's a that's an interesting question. Um, but we do owe God's revelation also a kind of absolute obedience because it comes directly from him. Um, and then natural law, right? That's the rational creature's participation in eternal law. We also owe that an absolute obedience, again, because it's, it's uh, directly from God. Um, and cannot be in error. Um, but then when we get to human ecclesiastical law, right, the church's hierarchy, religious superiors, they have their authority from God for sure, but we give them a conditional obedience, right, that's based on trust, rightful subordination, preservation of ecclesiastical common good. They themselves have to be in harmony with, with God's law, with revelation, with natural law. Um, then we can scroll we scroll up a bit more uh, or pull out however you want to do it. Um, I was going to go down to the next level, human, human civil law, right? Um, again, the, the civil authorities have their, their power from God. We reject, Catholics fundamentally reject the social contract theory, which derives authority from the governed, from the people. That's false. That was condemned explicitly many times. Um, all civil authority comes from God, just as Jesus said to Pontius Pilate, right? You would have no power uh, unless it had been given to you from above, right? Not from the people. Um, but it's even more obvious in the case of human civil law than in the case of ecclesiastical law that uh, that our obedience to kings and pre and presidents and prime ministers and so on is a conditional obedience, right? They have responsibilities and obligations to the higher, 
rulers and the higher law, uh, higher laws uh, that would control what they're able to command or forbid, and, and therefore our obedience to them. And then you get to you know to the level of family. And what's interesting about family is, of course, the the father in the family has a divinely established authority. Um, but the family, as Aristotle taught and as St. Thomas teaches, and this is the Catholic Church and you know endorses this, that the family is not a complete society. The family is a part of civil society. And so the father of a family does not have the kind of power over his family that a king or a president has over the people. Uh, it's in a way more natural, the father's authority, but it's not um, an authority, for example, that extends to life and death, right? You can't have the death penalty in a family. Um, however much, uh, you know, uh, rebellious children may try your nerves. You, there, there are limits to what families can do. And that's because the families themselves are meant to be part of a higher and more perfect human society. Um, so again, you know, within a family, this is really in a way the most obvious situation where if we know what, what family abuse looks like, that is, we know what it looks like when a father is abusing his children or his wife, and we recognize, oh, okay, there are limits there. You know, the wife doesn't have to do everything her husband asks her to do. The children don't have to do everything their parents ask them to do if what is being asked is something that conflicts with civil law or ecclesiastical law or natural law or divine law, right? All of those higher levels. Um, and then finally, you could get to this lowest level. I put it in there because I think it's it's a part of human life, right? When you work for a company, they're going to have rules and policies and standards. Um, if you belong to a club, if you belong to some kind of union, right? But these are voluntary associations. And so, the, you know, it would be strange to say like the head of the plumbers union, you know, has divine authority. I mean, that's, we don't really think that way as we would think about a father or a president or a bishop or the Pope or something. Um, rather, it's a voluntary organization. So we agree to be part of it. And in as much as we agree to be part of it, we agree to abide by whatever legitimate rules it has. So that's a kind of like a faintest level of obedience and authority when you get down to a level like that. Okay. Yeah. Now, can you just for clarity's sake, can you give an example of the first part of the pyramid, just example of each of these? Yes. So, I mean, with with God, of course, it just simply means God himself, right? Um, the revealed divine law is when he says, this is what you must do. Um, you must love your neighbor as yourself. And this is what you must not do. You must not commit adultery or murder or idolatry or whatever. Um, and so those, and, and with liturg the reason liturgical providence is mentioned in that is that when God reveals his will to us, he also reveals how he wishes us to worship him, the right worship that he demands. Um, and in the Old Testament, of course, that's very detailed. Uh, you know, there's a detailed code of worship. And that code is not abolished. It's fulfilled in new covenant worship um, in the Holy Mass and in the sacraments of the church. Uh, and and therefore, we, we need to be able to recognize that God's will for us, to which we should be obedient, to which we ought to be obedient, is revealed over the whole course of salvation history, Old Testament, New Testament, and the history of the church, right? And this is why, among other things, a, a fundamental and radical shift in how we worship God could never be right. That could never be right. That would always be against God's liturgical providence. Um, and when, when you get to natural law, right, um, there, I mean, the, the examples are going to be somewhat similar to the revealed divine law, at least the revealed divine moral law, because in the Ten Commandments, God is simply revealing to us foolish simpletons, things that we ought to be able to know by the exercise of our reason. If we weren't fallen and if we weren't subject to disordered concupiscence and so on, we would actually see with our reason, as Aristotle did, as Plato did, um, and many other pagans, you know, that murder is always wrong. Um, you know, that adultery is always wrong. And these are things you can find in Aristotle's ethics, for example. Okay. And so now, and you notice, um, I noticed in this, the hierarchy here, you have the divine law is obedience of faith aided by reason, but then the natural law is obedience of reason aided by faith. So can you comment at all on the use of <laughs> faith and reason with this obedience? Yes, yes. Thanks for asking. I'm glad you noticed that detail. Um, so with, with, with divine revelation, in as much as we accept something because it's revealed by God, 
um, we're accepting it on faith. That is, we have faith in God's word. He is all truthful. He can neither deceive nor be deceived. Um, and so uh, we, we take it on his word. That's basically what faith means. <clears throat> but <clears throat> our reason can illuminate, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> can illuminate the basis of that which we accept on faith. And, and that's the work of a great theologian like St. Thomas Aquinas is to explain to us, oh yes, you know, all of those strange laws that God gave to the Israelites, even the ceremonial and, uh, and, and judicial laws, which sometimes seem very puzzling to us when we read them now in the book of Leviticus, they all had good reasons behind them. And he lays out what all those reasons were, right? So that's faith aided by reason. With, with natural law, there, the, the, the basis of accepting natural law is that we are rational creatures who participate as uh, in, in, God's, in God himself and his eternal law because we're made to his image and likeness. And so in a sense, natural law could be described as man reading within his own mind or his own heart the truth that God has inscribed on his own nature. So it's, so it's, it's, it's fundamentally a rational law. Um, but as I said before, because we're weak creatures and because our reasoning power is, is weak uh, and, and, we're, and we're sinful, um, faith comes to the aid of reason uh, and, and shows us, points us towards what we ought to have been able to figure out um, with, with good reasoning. And so that's why there's a certain overlap between the revealed divine law and the natural law, right? God does reveal certain things that nevertheless belong to the natural law. Okay, and you say on human ecclesiastical law, you say, in order to be binding, this and each subsequent sphere of law, so those those lower ones below human ecclesiastical law, must be in harmony with those above it. So can you break down, using your distinctions here, can you break down, uh, so 1969, the Novus Ordo was uh, promulgated. Uh, Paul VI, clearly, in his general addresses, he essentially says that this is a law, uh, and there, the the allowance to say the old mass was allowed by indult, which by definition is an exception to a, a law. So it was, even though it wasn't quite as Benedict says, it wasn't it wasn't formally abrogated. True, it wasn't formally yet. There was a sort of a de facto abrogation, a de facto situation created, <laughs> where the ecclesiastical law, the ecclesiastical authority, had every intention, it seems, to abrogate the old mass. And then the trads said, no, we will disobey. So what exactly, how, how do they, how did they justify themselves? Mm -hmm. Why were they right in this? Yes. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, when you look at the early traditionalists, they make very similar arguments. I mean, the traditional movement has never really fundamentally altered its manner of argumentation. Um, they argued first that the church had always universally praised and upheld its liturgical tradition, right? That's an exceptionless rule. There was never a time in the entire history of the church when a pope convened a committee or, or put together a committee and the committee reconstructed the liturgy and threw out a bunch of things and made up a bunch of new things, uh, you know, all on the basis of some kind of cockamamie theory about what modern, what people need at this point in time. Uh, and so the, the basic objection was the church has never acted this way towards her liturgical tradition, uh, and, and on the contrary, has always been jealously guarding it um, and, and attached to it, and in fact, um, uh, opposing heretics who would claim that there is something defective about it or something distorted in it or something useless or harmful or whatever it might be. Um, you know, you see that very clearly in a document like Auctorum Fidei of Pius VI, uh, or in uh, in Quo Graviora of Gregory the Sixteenth, um, they condemned ahead of time, so to speak, all the theories that the lit liturgists uh, were saying in the 1950s and 1960s that led to the Novus Ordo. Um, so I think the traditionalists just recognized here a massive cognitive dissonance, right, <laughs> between the teaching and practice of the Church of all ages and what was being pushed now in the name of modern man, in the name of modern liturgical theory. Uh, all of which was highly, I mean, had been critiqued and was highly questionable on philosophical and theological grounds and on sociological and anthropological grounds as well, right? That is to say, even human scientific examination of the theories that were being propounded and acted on 
was arguing this is going to be a disaster in the church. It's going to lead to people leaving the church. It's going to weaken the missionary and apostolic efforts of the church. Um, it's going to, you know, anyway, it's, it, so the, all of this was, I think, very well mapped out uh, in terms of or the early traditional objections. So there's a there's a back and forth that happens between Archbishop Lefebvre and Paul VI later in the 70s, which is where I, I'm not sure exactly the chronology, but I think Lefebvre was suspended out of Venice or, or he was he was forbidden from ordaining or something. But there's a moment where Paul VI says he says, I'm uh, Basically, I'm the Pope. Is it not my role to determine what is tradition and what is not? <laughs> yes. Um, and so there, there is a sense that he's right. But how do we break? How do we parse that out? Because our mm -hmm. critics are saying to us, well, you are Martin Luther. You're disobeying the Pope. You're saying because Martin Luther did say that there were councils that contradict each other. There was popes that contradicted each other. I'm going to act on my conscience. So. How, how would you answer that objection and how do you break down that uh what the statement of paul the sixth yeah so f fundamentally that what paul the sixth there said to lefebvre cannot possibly be true the pope is not the one who determines the content of tradition he's not the arbiter of tradition he, he's, he can't just say you know uh in the manner of louis the 14th l'église c'est moi you know i am the church right he he's not he's the he's the 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 head of the church on earth for a certain period of time underneath the true and eternal head of the church, Jesus Christ. Uh, and basically the, the, to the Pope is entrusted the deposit of faith and the sum total of the tradition of the church, which is made up of both unchanging and changeable things, right? That is to say divine tradition and human ecclesiastical tradition. But that whole inheritance of tradition is something that popes have always seen themselves as, uh, you know, as the, the divinely appointed uh, guardians of, right? Not as they're they're not like a shopkeeper who can like decide to stock this bit of tradition and decide to throw out that other one, or you know, it, it doesn't make any sense to have this mentality. Um, but I guess getting to the question of the the objection of Luther, to me that has always seemed ridiculous that objection. And you know, I wrote an article at One Peter Five about this. If somebody wants to look up more, you know, our our Catholic traditionalists like Luther, you know, I forget exactly what the title of the article was. Um, but it's absurd because Martin Luther, he, the reason he was a heretic is precisely because he de he denied Catholic tradition in its totality. He attacked the Church Fathers. He attacked many of the councils of the church. He attacked the papacy after a certain point, right? He, he was rejecting the whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel, right? And all he wanted to keep was whatever subjective bits and pieces he could glean from sacred scripture, uh, according to his own reading of it, right? So you have this radical subjectivism um, and uh, this radical individualism and this really, really, really radical anti-traditional mentality with Luther. The irony is that what Luther proposed to do with the mass, with the liturgy, is exactly what the liturgical reformers did later on. So if you want to look for where Protestantism is, go and look at the liturgical reform in the, in the 20th century. That's where you find Martin Luther, not in the traditionalists who are trying to hold fast to what the church has always done. Yes, there's a, a great um, chart from Whispers of Restoration where they have um, Cramner's yeah. Anglican heretical mass compared with the Novus Ordo, and almost every point, it's it's the, making the same changes. Um, so regarding, right. and yeah. in fact, let me just mention that that, yeah, that chart is really valuable. You should all look it up if you. Yeah, I'll, you I'll put it on the screen. Uh, you should you should check this out because right as Mar as Michael Davies pointed out in one of his best books, Cranmer's God the Order. That's that's like a classic classic book. Um, Michael Davies pointed out that all the changes that were made in the Anglican liturgy, and there were hundreds of them. Every, even ones, even changes that were, so to speak, unobjectionable in themselves, that is, you could give it a Catholic spin, or you could give it a Protestant spin, but all of the changes were made, the sum total of the changes were made, to shift the meaning of the liturgy from a representation of the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary, that is, to make actual and present the act of our redemption, so that we can participate in it and be redeemed and be saved, um, to shift it from that to a memorial of the Lord's Supper. Okay, so this is what that's what Cranmer wanted, um, and you can see that the contrast between between Cranmer's idea and really all of the Protestant 
uh, reformers' ideas of what the Mass was or what the Eucharist was, um, and then just contrast it with the Catholic understanding that was perfectly summarized in the Council of Trent. And I, I emphasize perfectly because there is nothing in the doctrine of the Eucharist and of the Mass that is missing from the Council of Trent. You know, it even talks about the communal meaning of the sacrifice and that all of us participate in it. You know, I mean, in other words, it doesn't neglect any of the points that the liturgical movement was interested in, but it also really strongly emphasizes the real presence of Christ via transubstantiation, um, the, the, the dignity and, and, and uniqueness of the new covenant priesthood, and especially the sacrificial nature of the mass offered for the living and for the dead, right? That's the, the Council of Trent is, is unambiguous and supremely authoritative on these questions. Um, and Cranmer's right, all those changes are just chipping away piece by piece by piece by piece at the Catholic understanding of these things. And then you look at the Novus Ordo and piece by piece by piece by piece, every, almost everything that Cranmer did was done in the Novus Ordo. Now, now, of course, somebody can say, well, okay, well, that might be true and that's puzzling and maybe it's disturbing, but the transubstantiation still happens because you know the words of consecration are valid if you have a valid priest and valid matter. And so, okay, true, that's true, but it should be disturbing and it should bother the heck out of us that, 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 that liturgically speaking, all of the things that the Protestants wanted were then implemented in the Novus Ordo and that the first edition of the General Instruction of the Roman Missal this is the one that Cardinals Bacci and Ottaviani and the group of Roman the theologians objected to in the, in the so-called Ottaviani intervention, the short critical study on the new order of the mass. Um, that original edition of the general instruction was arguably heretical. I would say materially heretical because it presents a definition of, of the mass, which says nothing about sacrifice. Uh, it says it, it 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 just defines it as the commemoration of the Lord's Supper, right? That's that was the first edition of the instruction that was supposed to present the Novus Ordo Mass to the world, and after Bacci and Ottaviani objected to that and said, "This is Protestant. This sounds like Luther or, or Cranmer," um, you know, oh well, you know, quietly that first edition was revised and they put in some Trentine language, you know, some language from the Council of Trent, and then they reissued it. But there was, you know, I mean, this is the kind of games that we're dealing with in liturgical reform. And the traditionalists have been perceptive from the very first moment about what was going on. It was a Protestantized, a, a Protestant mentality, a modernist and Protestant mentality that was um, distorting the whole liturgical heritage and tradition of the church. That's why traditionalists were objecting. So can you talk about how do, how do we as the faithful form our true consciences mm -hmm. a, a true understanding of conscience and our the census fidelium because I, I love what you do in the book because you talk about the fact that the protestants the progressives and heretics have invoked conscience mm -hmm. and but you invoke conscience how do we can you break down what is the catholic doctrine on conscience how do we properly understand this and properly understand the limits of obedience in this case Yes. Yeah. No, it's a good question because, I mean, as I say in the book, conscience has been given a bad name. Uh, it's been given a bad name by the Hans Kungs and the Charles Currens uh, of the world who have invoked conscience airily. You know, oh, well, you know, if your conscience says that you shouldn't follow humane vitae, you know, you should use contraception, well, then that's just fine. Well, no, it's not fine. Because again, why? Because the church authoritatively upholds an unbroken tradition, that both of those things are important, there's magisterium and there's tradition, uh, that contraception is inherently intrinsically wrong, right? It can never be right. Um, so, so there's no question here, you can't invoke conscience against something which is definitively taught by the Catholic Church. And when I say definitively taught, I mean, you know, de fide, right? We're talking about something that, you know, where there's no exception, the tradition is unanimous, um, you know, that would be something like the, the all male ministerial sacrificial priesthood or the ban on contraception and, and similarly the ban on divorce and, uh, and remarriage and so forth and communion for the divorced and remarried. These things are matters of, they're matters of, of divine law, uh, of natural law in some cases. Uh, and, you know, these are matters on which no exceptions are possible, right? So those who, there's no appeal to conscience for that. If you appeal to conscience, really what you're just saying is, I don't like it. 
I don't desire to follow that. So I, I'm just not going to do it. Right. I mean, just be honest about what it is. I disagree with the church. I disagree with tradition. That's what you're saying. Right. But conscience is the is the, you know, conscience is the power in us by which we make a practical judgment about what is to be done or not done. Right. So I am allowed to do this. I must do this or I must not do this. Right. That's the that's the voice of conscience telling us. And obviously, the, the conscience is going to be stronger or weaker depending upon what kind of education or formation we've had. Um, the way I like to look at it is this. If you have grown up in a Catholic, in a practicing Catholic family, you've been going to church all your life, you, you have been prepared for the sacraments with a suitable catechesis, you've been catechized with a faithful, authentic, traditional catechism like the Baltimore Catechism, you know, and I mean, we all know people nowadays Thanks be to God. Even now, after the council, there are there are families who whose children have memorized the responses to the Baltimore Catechism. Uh, you know, you can ask them a question that you know maybe some some seminarians might not even be able to answer nowadays with the with the the decline in in standards. And these children can just tell you right right away what the answer is. Well, that's what catechisms were for, right? They were meant to form people in knowing the truth, and not they're not books of opinions and speculations and whatever. They're just to, to, this is what the church has always taught. And when you look at um, there's something called um, Tradivox, which I'm sure you know about. It's this yes. wonderful series of catechisms. I've got several of them here. I don't know if I could find them. I'm not going to try to find them right now. And take people's time, but. There are, you know, Tradivox is publishing. Yeah, there's a good example of it, but they've got several volumes of it right now. And the goal of this project from Sophia Institute Press is to publish, you know, I don't know, dozens of classic Catholic catechisms from many different centuries to show all these catechisms have their own character, their own language. Some of them are kind of charmingly old fashioned, right? You know, you read like one from the 17th century and it's in like, you know, the like the English of that period has got nice little wood cuts that of, you know, of, of Elizabethan people, you know, I mean, uh -huh. so there are some really charming aspects, but the thing that's so wonderful about this series is that they all teach the same thing. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of catechisms. Uh, from the time when catechisms, uh, as we think of them, became popular, basically in the Reformation period, the, the Protestants were cranking out their own Protestant catechisms. So the Catholics, like St. Peter Canisius, great Jesuit saint, patron of catechists, you know, he was cranking out his own catechism. He had three versions, right? The mama bear, the papa bear, and the baby bear. It's called the great catechism, the middle, the medium catechism, and the little catechism, right? Um, uh, you know, and, and so all of these catechisms for centuries agreed. They taught the same faith. If you picked any of these catechisms at random and you taught your children with it, you would all end up with the same answers. Okay. That's now that right there is a sign of the universal ordinary magisterium of the church. Okay. And that is the faith. That's the faith. So this is why traditionalists are entirely justified in objecting to something like Pope Francis's change on the death penalty. Sorry, that is completely contrary to the unanimous tradition of the church as exhibited, for example, in all of these catechisms. It cannot be right, it cannot be accepted, it must be rejected, okay? Um, and we can say the same thing about chapter eight of Amoris Laetitia, right? This opening for like after the divorced and remarried person who was sacramentally married, but now, now married to somebody else, you know, but they discern with their pastor and they can go to confession and communion, but they can still live more exorio. No, no, forget it. This doesn't make any sense. This is a hash and a hack job. And it's 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 blasphemous, actually, um, towards the Eucharist. It's sacrilegious. So th this is what. So when you have a so getting back to the point, when a Catholic has been well catechized, well formed, um, their conscience will tell them, "I can't do this. I can't. I can't uh, desecrate the Eucharist. I can't be unfaithful to my spouse. I can't." Um, you know, I, I can't accept this novelty about the death penalty, right? That's where the Catholic conscience will speak authoritatively. And that's connected with, I connect it with the census fidelium, right? The census fidelium is, it's not obviously the same thing as the conscience. Conscience is a particular power of practical reason. Um, but but the census fidelium is, is understood by the church as the, the possession of the faith as a gift that God gives to all the baptized. So all the baptized and confirmed in, in a special way 
uh, you know, have received this gift of faith. They have a kind of seed within themselves that can grow if it's given the proper growth conditions. Um, certainly catechesis is part of those growth conditions. And the census fidelium, the church itself says, or at least a document, um, I shouldn't say the church, but a document from the International Theological um, Commission says, let me just read this passage here. It's, I quote it in the book. The census fidei fidelis, right? The sense of the faith of the faithful confers on the believer the capacity to discern whether or not a teaching or practice is coherent with the true faith by which he or she already lives. The census fidei fidelis also enables individual believers to perceive any disharmony, incoherence, or contradiction between a teaching or practice and the authentic Christian faith by which they live. Alerted by their census fidei, individual believers may deny assent even to the teaching of legitimate pastors if they do not recognize in that teaching the voice of Christ, the Good Shepherd. Right? Those are remarkable words, and that's that's in a document from the International Theological Commission um, from from a few years back. Uh, so you know, and and we so if a Catholic is we 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 see this especially in the liturgical domain. There are Catholics who go to a mass and they say something was wrong with that mass. I, 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 I'm not a theologian. I can't put my finger exactly on it, but something was wrong. The, the Eucharistic prayer was wrong and, you know, or the way they were treating the Eucharist was wrong or something like that, or the music was awful and it was so inappropriate, right? That's the census fidei at work, right? It's not, it's not like, oh, my, it's not my taste in music. No, it's that some music, according to the teaching of the church, by the way, some music is objectively suited for the mass and some of it isn't, right? And people, even uneducated people can perceive these things. Yeah, I, I love what you said. That, I mean, that document, just for viewers, that he's uh, Dr. K is quoting from Census Fidei in the Life of the Church. That's the name of the document. Uh, that was numbers 61 to 62. That's the International Theological Commission. Um, so as you note in the book, that's not a magisterial text, but it is a witness to what is universally held. Mm -hmm. So it's basically witnessing to an ordinary magisterial teaching um, in, is what that is. Right. And the reason I, I bring this up, and let me just try to kind of summarize why I think this is important, um, is that there's been for too long a kind of perception uh, and maybe, I mean, this goes back before the Second Vatican Council, and in fact, it might be one of those legacies of the old days that we're still living under that we need to get rid of, that the faith in some sense is the per, is the possession of the Pope, maybe also of the bishops, unless you think of the bishops as just being like branch managers of the CEO at the Vatican, which is typically the way nowadays that Pope Francis is acting and, and that people think of it. Um, and like the pillar seems to think that way, um, among others, you know. Uh, he can just fire his branch managers and 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 so forth. Um, so you know, if, if the faith is the possession of the Pope and possibly the bishops also, it's not the possession of the faithful. The faithful are, in a sense, they're just there to have what the faith is dished out to them. It, it's coming from the outside. Um, it maybe benefits them, you know, especially at birth and death and marriage. Um, but it's not really their possession. The, 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 the laity are kind of excluded from this process. It's like an exclusive club that has the faith and they get to determine what it is. And then they, and then we just have to accept whatever they say it is. No, that, that's completely absurd. And, and nobody has ever thought that way. Um, I mean, a great example of nobody thinking that way is Cardinal Newman's book, The Arians of the Fourth Century, right? One of his great works uh, written while he was still an Anglican, but part of his conversion, certainly, in, in the bigger picture. Um, Newman studied carefully what was happening in the fourth century Arian controversy, and he documents carefully that it was the lay faithful who primarily kept the faith during the Arian controversy. Uh, and when I say he documents it, he gives extensive quotations from church fathers and historians of that period, uh, that is, historians living at, that, at the Arian controversy and, and shortly afterwards, saying things like, when the, new, when the Arians showed up in a town, the Catholic faithful drove them out, you know, or when an Arian bishop showed up, they refused to go to mass with him, you know, or, you know, and, and Athanasius and Basil the Great and some other, you know, wonderful anti-Arian fathers of the church, uh, Hil Hilary of Poitiers, they, they themselves said it was the lay faithful who kept the Nicene faith 
when most of the bishops were Arian or semi-Arian or just cowardly and not doing anything about it. Um, that's the census fidei at work, right? Yeah, I, I think I, I love how you break it down because it's a census fidei is given to, it's really passed down. A priest gives it to us, it catechizes us, and the parents receive the, the their catechism. They have the census fidei, but they could not possibly pass down that faith to their children if they did not have a sense of fidei. They didn't have a conscience that understood the basics of the faith that were necessary for salvation. Yes. So they could give their give to their children. They don't need to ask any priest for permission to catechize yeah. their own children. Yes. They know yeah. the basics of the faith. And if any priest tried to disrupt that passing down of the faith to their own children, they could they could just disobey that priest because the right. priest is under a greater authority. Exactly. Right. And and so and the the point I'm also making is that 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 the, the gift of the faith, the gift of faith, by which I mean the theological virtue, by which we assent to what God reveals by the authority of the revealer, um, but also the sense, of, but also the faith, that is the totality of the Catholic faith, is something that is committed to each believer in baptism, right? So I, I as a layman, possess the faith as much as the Pope does. I don't have the, I don't have the job the Pope does. I don't have the role he has in the church. I don't have the authority he has, etc. But the faith is is the same, and it's mine, and it's his by divine gift, right? Um, and this is why you know I'm using. I think your example is actually a really good one. I know the situation. I know many situations actually where where Catholic families, usually large homeschooling Catholic families, with a very good uh, understanding of the catechism, you know, they simply want to catechize their own children. Uh, and, and so they've also prepared them for First Communion and for confirmation. Uh, and that's, that's entirely within the rights of the parents as the primary educators by divine law of their family. But, but I've known these situations where priests have said, you're not allowed to do that. You have to enroll your children in the First Communion class or in the confirmation class. No, you don't have to do that. I mean, you shouldn't be rude about it. You should talk in a friendly way. So this pastor would just say, you know what, Father, we actually... We, we actually can, we love to educate our children and we're doing a really good job with it. We think we are. You can quiz our children. You know, you have totally the right to quiz our children, you know, to make sure that they're ready for First Communion and for confirmation. But you don't have the right to demand that you educate them over us, right? <laughs> That's just not there. Uh, and so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of confusion about these things nowadays, but it's good for us to be clear about them. Yeah, Catholic schools and catechetical classes put on by the parish are simply means to assist the parents who are the primary educators of their children. Right. And, um, and unfortunately what we've seen in, I mean, this is a whole separate subject and a fascinating one, but what the parochial school system did, I mean, it, it was born at least in part at a time when parents were working so much, especially immigrant parents, you know, working in on farms or in factories or whatever that they probably didn't have time or ability to catechize their children or at least to do a decent job of it. I mean, I'm not an expert in that area, but I'm, I'm just going to assume that the parochial schools were meeting a really grave need when, especially in this country, when they when the whole big parochial school system was born and when it flourished um, in the old days when the nuns were teaching and so forth. Um, so, I mean, if I were a parent, you know, and I looked at a school that was full of religious sisters who really knew the faith and who were a great example for the children, I'd be very happy to send my children to that school, right? Um, and so, we can understand how it developed, but what happened over time, over a century and more, is that the attitude grew that actually the parents, it's not that the parents are the primary educators of the children, the church is the primary education, ed, educator of the children. And, you know, and this, that's when you get into this weird inversion of roles where it's, you know, like you have bishops and priests who are offended at homeschoolers. Like, why are you homeschooling? You should, the children should be in the school. Well, no, the school is there as a substitute for families that don't want to educate or not able to educate their own children, you know? So, yeah, absolutely. And, and this, so this is how a, this is how, you know, I can form, I'm trying to form my young son and form his conscience. So that he his conscience under, knows the difference between right and wrong, yes. and then in a situation he can use his conscience is going to be properly formed so that his conscience will tell him. So I let me I want to read this great passage that you have on conscience. I think because you you distinguish between these two different views on conscience, and then you can also if you want to comment when you respond to this on 
St. Thomas's different distinctions in, in obedience. So mm-hmm. that, that gets into this. So this is page 47. You say in the 60s and 70s and 80s, making a big deal of conscience was the province of progressives trying to dissent from perennial teachings such as the ban on contraception. Liberals continue to deploy the word as a cover for immoral acts, especially against the sixth and ninth commandments. For them, conscience seems to mean something like my desires as an autonomous modern person uninformed by or unwilling to submit to God's law. End quote. Uh, this politicization distorted uh, distortion gave rise to an op- opposite reaction among conservatives and traditionalists who likewise abused the word by making well-formed conscience equivalent to automatic submission to external authority, which in keeping with neo-ultramontanism came down to the will of the Pope as the one and only principle of action necessary for virtuous Catholics. So I thought that was a break, great breakdown of these two false understandings of conscience. Um, can you comment at all on that and St. Thomas's proper t- distinctions? Yeah. So, so of course, you know, when you look at the crisis, uh, when you look at modern philosophy, right, modern philosophy starts with Descartes, arguably, okay, here's one story of modern philosophy. It starts with Descartes' radical subjectivism, right? So the, the Descartes withdraws into himself. He denies the reality of the external world, at least as a thought experiment, and ends up saying, the only thing I can be certain of is my own consciousness, you know, and then he tries to sort of spin out the whole of reality from his own mind. Um, that's Cartesianism. Obviously, that's it's more sophisticated than that. But anyway, that's the nutshell version for this purpose. Uh, and so the whole of modern philosophy after that becomes plagued with subjectivism. It's always people, modern philosophy is trapped within the mind, trying to reestablish a connection with reality outside the mind. That's the whole problem of modern philosophy. So part of the reason why I think Leo XIII was promoting the recovery of St. Thomas Aquinas, because St. Thomas Aquinas is... You know, he's a moderate realist like Aristotle. He's somebody who accepts the reality of the external world as that which we first know and which we know best. We know it better than we know our own minds. In fact, uh, you know, that is, we know that the glass of water is here and it's cold and it's refreshing even more than we know what consciousness is. Right. Um, and so, um, you know, the, it, it, the, ex- the external world is what informs us and makes us knowers um, and on the basis of that knowledge of reality, we can ascend to a knowledge of God and even of the immortality of the soul, right? This is classic, classical philosophy, Aristotelian philosophy. Um, now, I mention that because the crisis in philosophy also becomes a crisis in theology uh, in, the, in the sense that theologians end up trapped within certain paradigms, like a Kantian paradigm or a Hegelian paradigm, where theology becomes, again, it becomes a kind of human construct and trapped within its own confines. And the connection to God, to faith, to divine revelation is weakened or even severed. And that's part of the crisis of modernism. Um, gosh, there's a lot to cover here. But anyway, uh, but so, so, the, so the appeals of the liberal and progressive and modernist theologians to conscience are really a form of subjectivism. It's like, I, my will, my desire my sense of what's right and wrong is what's going to determine um, what I have a right to or what I should do, right? Well, when you when you get to that point, it's a disaster. I mean, that's at that point, even the Ten Commandments are up for grabs, right? right. Um, and that's where you get you have liberal Catholic theologians trying to defend abortion, for example. You know, even though it's so obviously contrary to the, the commandment against murder, right? But they've gotten themselves tied up in knots because of subjectivism, and and they're making everything dependent on my desire. Now, when you have that kind of situation, which is a very grave crisis. Um, there's going to be a temptation to try to find an easy solution. Okay, human beings are lazy. I'm really convinced of this. One of our big problems is laziness. And so we want to find an easy solution to our problems. And that's why that's why like the welfare state is such a disaster, right? It's, it's, it's an easy solution to poverty. Well, it never works. Easy solutions never work. So the easy solution to subjectivism is to say, all we need is an external authority that's always right. And then we can just, we can sort of like outsource our moral decisions to this external authority right yeah. and if if it's you know god gave us this external authority boom here he is he's called the pope and whatever the pope says to do that's what we do we don't have to think about it we don't have to sweat about it we've now escaped from subjectivism you know we're always going to be right well whoever said that in church history that is the, that's the most ridiculous view i've ever heard the 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 pope 
has an office with a certain job to do. And as the record of history shows, he can do the job well or badly. He can do a mediocre job or an excellent job, a canonizable job or an execrable job, right? I mean, this is, and, and, and we also know from Vatican I and from other sources that it, not everything the Pope says, much less everything he does, is normative for us, right? You know, if the Pope decides to violate a rule by washing the feet of women, and then to violate it, to change the rule and violate it again by washing the feet of Muslims, that has no normative force for us whatsoever. And if, as I said before, if he decides to change the catechism to say the death penalty is inadmissible, and then he footnotes himself, because he's the only source for that that exists, uh, to a speech where he says that the death penalty is per se contrary to the gospel, thereby consigning 2,000 years of catechisms and church fathers and doctors and so on, and in other councils and popes, by the way, to error, okay, about the gospel, about the requirements, the per se re requirements of human dignity, right? What you look at that and you say, nope, that's not normative. That's not the Pope's role. He's just stepped outside of his role. He's just become Jorge Mario Bergoglio. Um, and, you know, I respect him and I pray for him, but he's wrong. And I'm, I'm certainly not going to follow that. So this is what I mean by the danger of outsourcing our conscience. We cannot do that. Right? Yeah, I, it, it seems that um, on the one hand, in the first the, with, among the press progressives, it's rationalism. It's it's reason, my my private reason against faith, whereas on the, on the other side, it's fideism. So it's, yes. it's faith, faith in the pope as sort of an oracle. And I deny my own reason. I'm going to check out, check my reason at the door, check my conscience at the door mm -hmm. and just deny that they exist, um, which also, in fact, denies Vatican I, because the first degree of Vatican I is about human reason, actually, which is yes. it's a funny, it's a great providential balancing, I yes. think, with Dei Filius and Pastor Eternus, sort of yeah. faith and reason together. Yeah, uh, right. And, and, and Dei Filius also very clearly mentions that you know, the faith is not something that evolves over time so that you're going to end up with new truths that weren't there before or with new doctrines that contradict the old doctrines, right? That's 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 ruled out dogmatically by the First Vatican Council. Um, so this appeal that is made nowadays by, unfortunately, by the Pope himself, but, but also by many others, to a development of doctrine that, that leads to the opposite, to the contradictory of something that was, was taught and done before, right? That's also completely uncatholic and can be known without difficulty to be uncatholic, right? And yeah. I, I really wanna emphasize this last point briefly. I wanna emphasize that I'm not, nobody has to be a professional um, uh, theologian with a doctorate in order to see the kinds of problems that we're talking about. Okay. I'm not talking about esoteric debates between Thomists and Scotists, you know, <laughs> right? I'm not about, you know, like, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about esoteric debates and saying that, you know, if you're not a black belt in medieval scholastic philosophy, man, you're hopeless. There's no way you can navigate life in the church. No, that's, that would be absurd. That would clear, that would have to be false, right? Because Christ came to save everyone, including the poor and simple. And, and unlettered people, right? Um, what I'm talking about are things that anybody with a basic penny catechism can see that there are problems with, right? So again, I'm not talking about sophisticated debates between theological schools. We're talking about bread and butter ABCs of Catholicism is the kind of stuff that, that I'm dealing with in true obedience. And the liturgy is, is one of these areas, right? That I think is a bread and butter area. Yeah, I think that's a great point to raise because there are certain things that are truly esoteric, you know, disputed. I was just reading about uh, Father Marquette in Michigan and how he became a Jesuit to become a missionary. And it especially it was the track in the Jesuits that went away from disputing about speculative dogmas. So he was just going to go be a missionary. So he's just dealing with the basics of the faith. He's not trying to and that's what every every parent really is, is sort of a missionary in the sense yeah. of catechizing your children and being a missionary to your neighbor, too, because yeah. you can you can preach the basics of the faith. You're not getting into a bunch of speculative stuff. So, you know, the basics of Trent, you know, the real presence, you know, the, the anathemas against the Protestants because you learn them in your catechism, which distinguished between Catholicism and Protestantism. Yes. So then when your your bishop and your priest comes to town and says, 
Well, the Second Vatican Council says we could, should have this Protestantized mass. That's when the census Vidalian should kick in and say, no, yes. that's wrong, because I learned that in fifth grade. Yes, exactly. And, and in fact, um, you know, sometimes people ask this question, you know, why was there not like a bigger uprising of the faithful at the time of the Second Vatican Council, or rather afterwards? Let's say, why between 1965 and 1970, was there not a much bigger uprising of the Catholic faithful against the liturgical changes, right? And they asked that question sometimes with genuine curiosity and sometimes with a skeptical air as if, well, surely, you know, if there was such a problem here, then, you know, many more millions of people would have objected to these things, right? Well, I think that the answer to that question is, is twofold. The first part is that when you study the history of the period, you recognize that there were a, there was a lot more objecting going on than we know now. Why? Because the victors write the history books. And so the, 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 the triumphant organizational uh, church, by which I mean the church men, not the church of Christ himself, but the church men who designed and implemented the reform, they were the ones who completely controlled the flow of information about it as much as they could. So all the official newspapers, practically all of them, all the official books, all the, all the accounts, all the celebrations and celebratory documents, they're always just praising. It's like the people's worker, the people's, uh, you know, the people's Republic of China right? It's always celebrating, you know, the five-year plan and how well it's going and everything's <laughs> going so wonderfully. And, you know, in spite of the statistics, which are deplorable and always worse, um, in most cases. Uh, and so, you know, there, there's a kind of false official line that's repeated over and over and over again that, and a lot of people only paying attention to that official line, just assume that that's the way that Catholics responded. Well, no, on the ground, the first thing that happened is the largest number of Catholics left the practice of the faith between roughly 1965 and 1975, the largest percentage of Catholics since the reformation. Okay. That's, that's a fact. So if you look at the time of in the 16th century, a huge number of Catholics left and became Protestants or were kind of, I don't know, it's a complicated thing. They didn't necessarily always choose to become Protestant. They kind of swam in Protestant waters and, and were often carried along with that, that revolutionary enthusiasm. And the next biggest number of Catholic defections was after the Second Vatican Council. Okay, why is that the case? So I'm not going to say the liturgy was the only reason. Nobody's going to say that. But was it was it a reason? Oh, sure. Of course. We have all kinds of testimonies from people saying, when the church changed her liturgy, I was so confused. I lost my faith. I thought if the church could be so wrong about her liturgy for all these centuries, then she must be wrong about everything else too. Or when I saw that the church abandoned this, this beautiful liturgy that I could pray at and replaced it with a jamboree, you know, I, I realized that the church must be false. I mean, there are all kinds of people saying things like this, right? And there were more uh, more movements of objectors than, than people recognize, right? There were all kinds of groups around the world uh, that were publishing letters in newspapers and advertisements and so on, asking for the Latin mass, asking for Gregorian chant, right? I mean, I, what I'm saying is that the census today was still there and right. it was still operative. And it was even operative, sadly and tragically, in a way, in the people who were so shocked and scandalized that they left, right? Yeah. Because they couldn't process, they couldn't see how it was possible for the church to do what looked like a 180 degree turn in regard to her central and most significant action, namely the liturgy, right? How, what does this say about any human institution? It, it would, it, it's, it's disastrous. That's what I mean earlier when I said sociological and anthropological arguments, right? Um, Anybody who had any sense of what rituality is and of what religion is would know that changing the liturgy in the way in which it was changed would only be catastrophic and could only be catastrophic. Um, so that's one aspect. The other aspect, real briefly, is, is that um, – uh, oh, let me just pick up my, my, my thought here. Um, oh, in, in that – okay, why weren't there more Catholics? There were some, of course, but why weren't there more Catholics who were objecting? and rebelling against, uh, you know, against the liturgical changes. Well, precisely because of this mentality of, of false obedience to external authority, what St. Thomas calls indiscreet obedience, right? I, we have to do what Father says. We have to do what Bishop says. We have to do what the Pope says, right? Well, I mean, if, if that's your mentality and, and you've sort of outsourced everything to the external authority in that manner, then, you know, you might be one of those people who hates it who hates what's going on, but you force yourself 
to do it, you know, like eat the spinach. It's good for you. Right. Um, you know, and, uh, I don't know, maybe you like spinach but and you're going to like it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, eat this, like eat this, you know, liver with onions and bacon, you know, and spinach because it's good for you, whatever. Um, and so, you know, I think that that was also operative and one of the fruits in divine providence of the revolution that we've gone through is it has forced us to re-examine this question of what is the papacy for and what are the limits of papal authority <clears throat> what are the conditions for the exercise of legitimate papal authority right and as you know um, and as an increasing number of catholics know and as my, my my little tract talks about these questions were talked about quite a bit in the history of the church and we just forgot about that you know the past 150 years or so uh it, catholics have forgotten that there was always especially in the Reformation period, a, a lively discussion of the nature and, and the role and the limits of the papacy, right? Um, so we, we yes. need to recover that. Yes, I was just trying to find the quote from Cardinal Rinze, where there's some back and forth with the press or something where they say, can the divorce and remarriage receive communion? And then he says something like, don't ask me, go, to, go ask a first communicant, because they're taught in their catechism, you can't receive communion in the state of mortal sin it's a it's a basic truth yes. of your yes. your number one catechism for first communion you have to go to confession you can't yeah. violate the sixth commandment so let me get a few um questions here uh first of all thank you paul for your donation he says yes sure priests can disobey unfortunately faithful uh really need to back up the priest who speaks up uh i and i think this was supposed to be a question so i'm just going to ask as a question uh so what can the faithful do uh, or what can priests do if they find themselves suspended without means to live? Yes. Yeah. So it's it's a, obviously a, a very um, apt and, uh, and pertinent question for our times because we are finding, this is another thing that a lot of Catholics don't know about, an increasing number of priests who are being hung out to dry in one form or another, right? Some priests are simply denied a, a pastoral position. So they're not penalized they're still receiving a salary, but they're given no assignment. So they're, they're just like high, high and dry. They have nothing to do. Okay. I mean, they can still celebrate mass privately and they can, you know, but, but they have no pastoral assignment. Then there are priests who, um, who are put under, under certain conditions or limitations. Like if you want to remain a priest in good standing in the diocese, you must give communion in the hand, right? This would be like, if there's a priest who says, I can't give communion in the hand anymore. I've seen too many abuses. I've seen, it's not right for us to do this. My conscience is not at peace with it. So I, I'm simply going to give communion on the tongue. I'm talking about in the Novus Ordo, let's say. Uh, you know, and I know priests like this who have been basically warned and, and then even punished for refusing to give communion in the hand. Um, there, are, you know, there aren't many examples of priests who've been excommunicated because in the modern Church of Mercy, uh, such as it is, not very merciful in general. But, um, but I mean, in the Church of Mercy, excommunication just sounds like incredibly medieval, like like um, like having the Inquisition with like you know putting dunce caps on people or something. So I think that we're not going to see, maybe maybe we will, but I don't think we're going to see a lot of excommunications, but suspensions for sure. You know, being deprived of pastoral assignments. And that's why there's, you know, there's something called the Coalition for Cancelled Priests. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's not the only organization of its kind, but it's the largest uh, and, and best connected one, networked. Um, you know, where they have they have dozens and dozens of priests right now who are in this kind of limbo situation in one, you know, for one reason or another. Sometimes it's about the Tridentine Mass. Sometimes it's just about the fact that they that they wouldn't go along with some of the COVID regulations um, and masking and vaccinations and so on. Uh, sometimes it had to do with preaching against um, against communion for divorced and, and remarried or whatever it is. There are all kinds of reasons for priests now to be canceled, to use this colloquial expression, right? It's a real problem because we're, you know, hey, last I checked, we were in a vocations crisis, right? You know, <laughs> and like the Archdiocese of Detroit, uh, I think they ordained one man to the priesthood this year. I think I read that somewhere. Oh, wow. And, you know, New York City recently in some recent year, I think ordained nobody or maybe they ordained one Hispanic or something, you know, I, I mean, we're talking about the collapse in the institutional Catholic Church is astronomical right now okay but, and and it's a and just to say one uh, statistic priests know right now they know it i've heard this from so many different sides 
that after the COVID period of mass obligation being removed by bishops, which is a whole separate scandal, uh, that one third of the congregations have disappeared and will never come back. One third. So uh, we were talking earlier about the defection of Catholics after the Reformation and then the defection of Catholics after, after the liturgical or during and after the liturgical reform. Well, here's the third biggest wave of Catholic defections now, at least in Western countries after COVID, where right? one third of the congregation is lost and is not coming back, even when the bishops say that people need to go back to church. Um, so, you know, Father Z says there's a demographic sinkhole right now um, about, you know, opening up beneath the, the, the church. And I, I think really what we have to see is there is only one way forward for the church coherently, and that's tradition. Traditional liturgy with all of its smells and bells, all of its orthodox prayers uh, jealously handed down over all the centuries, its Eucharistic reverence, everything that is good about it, its sacerdotalism, uh, you know, and I, that's the way forward. Traditional liturgy, traditional doctrine, based on sound catechesis on the councils and, and, and popes and fathers of the church and traditional morals, right? Based on the 10 commandments and the beatitudes, right? This is the only way forward. This is Catholicism. This is coherent and non self-contradictory. Um, and meanwhile, the, the mainstream institutional church is, is like, it's like a firestorm of contradictions, right? They can't even speak for three sentences without contradicting themselves, right? This is what we're seeing. Yeah. Uh, here's here's a question here from traditional Thomas. He says, how would you answer the argument from Paleocrat regarding St. Francis de Sales? So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to repeat this argument uh, if I can. I'm not sure if I'll do it properly, but uh, Paleocrat, Jeremiah Bannister, argues from the Catholic controversy by St. Francis de Sales when he argues against the Calvinists and the Protestants. And St. Francis de Sales essentially says this to the Protestants. He says, well, if you say you follow the Bible, you have to follow... Um, what, what, it's like Matthew 16 or 17, where it says, if your brother is erring, then you try to rebuke him. If, if then you bring two, but then if two don't work, then you take it to the church. And if he doesn't listen to the church, then treat him as a heathen. And so St. Francis de Sales says, well, you have to look for a judgment of the church. The question is, mm -hmm. by what authority? By what authority do you do what you do? Sure. Ultimately, the scripture says you have to go to the church to give you a definitive judgment. So yeah. Peter Kratz says, hey, traditionalists, the church, the hierarchy, the magisterium has spoken on the the Vatican II is an ecumenical council. It is it is a legitimate council, should be interpreted properly. And the Novus Ordo is, is the, as a, a form, at least, of the Roman Rite. Um, it's legitimate. Um, it's not, uh, I'm not sure what they've said exactly, but essentially the, the church has spoken on this disputed point, have they not? So that's that's the question. That's the um, that's the argument. What are your thoughts? Yeah, on that? no, I, I disagree with that. I think I think that the the problem right now that we have is what I call magisterium itis or the magisterium of the moment, where it doesn't matter what the church has ever taught in the past. It doesn't matter if there's an even an unbroken continuity of of teaching and practice on something if a new magisterial authority comes along and contradicts all of it well then obviously we have to follow the new magisterial authority i think that this is this is a profoundly dangerous and false move um it the only the only area in which that could be true if you want to preserve the historical and theological continuity and coherence of catholicism is in a purely disciplinary matter now I'm sorry, but liturgy is not a purely disciplinary matter, right? And that and that is manifestly clear. And I talk about that a lot in the tract. I mean, it'd be a whole, maybe we'd have to talk a lot longer to really flesh that out. But it's not a purely disciplinary matter, like, like uh, which day should you fast on, okay? I mean, I agree that the Pope has the authority to modify the Eucharistic fast. Um, I don't think it's incompatible with Catholic obedience to say he has that authority, but it was a mistake for Paul VI to make it just one hour. You know, it was a mistake for this reason, this reason, and this reason. Catholics have always been free to intelligently and respectfully make those kinds of comments about papal discipline, because we know that disciplinary actions can be mistaken, even if the Pope has the authority to, to implement them. But, you know, the, 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 um, the argument given by the Council of Trent about the liturgy and reaffirmed in Cool Primum of Pius V 
is clear. It's it's clear that because of the link between Lex Orandi and Lex Credendi and Lex Vivendi, that we're, that liturgy is not just a merely disciplinary matter over which the Pope has complete discretion, right? So I just I just simply reject the applicability of the St. Francis de Sales argument in that case. Okay. All right. Uh, let me let me field one more question. This is kind of a softball for you. Um, so Floridian since 1994 says, my Novus Ordo parish is pretty conservative, but Monsignor said that the way the Novus Ordo is conducted is the way it was done by the first Christians. Uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Isn't the Novus Ordo <laughs> the way the early Christians? Oh my gosh. Did? Yeah, that's that's one of the that's one of the biggest myths uh, in the world. In a world full of myths, that's one of the biggest ones. Um, so, I the basic answer to that is the early. So, I'll say a few things. The early literature, the, the early records about the early liturgy of the church are few and far between. They're sporadic and they're even sometimes contradictory. So it's actually very difficult to say precisely what the early liturgy looked like. And that was quite convenient for those liturgical revolutionaries because it meant they could invent, invent all kinds of stuff and attribute it to the early church uh, without anybody really being able to object to them because most people are not scholars who study these things. So the first thing is we don't know exactly what the early liturgy looked like. Secondly, all the records we do have from the early liturgy suggest that it was a lot more like what we would call the traditional liturgy today than the Novus Ordo is, right? Very early on, the prayers were formalized in a, in a, in a hieratic, um, high-level language, right? Not a popular vernacular. Um, the, 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 the clergy early on were, you know, were using, they were using incense, of course, in continuity with the Old Testament. They were facing eastwards, which is, which St. Basil the Great says was an apostolic custom, apostolic uh, tradition um, from from the apostles themselves. You know they were. Um, you know, I mean, I could go on and on using chant. I mean, all of the things that we associate to typically today with the Tridentine Mass are simply the historical continuity that we have kept for all ages with the early Church. Right? There was never a big moment of rupture or interruption where a fundamentally new liturgy was was conceived. So what you get in the 1570 Missal promulgated by Pius V is the mature, organically developed form of the early church's liturgy, right? And, and so you shouldn't take, you shouldn't believe anybody who says uh, the contrary of that. If you want, by the way, though, I've got a little article about this at New Liturgical Movement called The Specter of False Antiquarianism. And I take up exactly this objection and show why it's false. I give more details there. Excellent. Yes, um, very important comment there. Antiquarianism um important issue um well dr k thanks so much for your conversation again true obedience in the church you can go to trueobedience.com to get a free copy if you are a clergy or seminarian um and uh please buy a copy buy two send one to a friend or a seminarian or a priest um and any final comments for us on the subject yes let me just mention here um you might have seen this timothy but uh in recent days, my latest work has been released. Um, it's, oh, yes. I know we're, we're talking about one book, but, but I've got uh, two more books out, a set um, called The Road from Hyperpapalism to Catholicism. Uh, and the subtitle is Rethinking the Papacy in an Age of Ecclesial Disintegration. Um, so this, this, is, this is basically almost all the subjects that we've been talking about come up again in more detail in these books. The first book is Theological Reflections on the Rock of the Church. Yes, thank you. And the uh, the second volume is Chronological Responses to an Unfolding Pontificate. Um, so first volume is more about what is the papacy, um, and the second volume is about Pope Francis's pontificate. So Aruka Press, um, you know, you can, you see here, there's a discount for the two volume set. You can also get the volumes separately from each other. And they were written to be read, to be read, to be readable separately. So you can pick up either one depending upon your interest. So I thought I would mention that because it's very, very relevant to all the things we've been talking about. Yes, we've definitely, we've touched on that a few times, the neo alternamontanism or hyper papalism. Yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, and this is, this is a situation that sort of developed before Vatican II. And then by means of that, the revolutionaries helped to push all this, uh, all of these problems that we're trying to deal with. Exactly. It's, and that was, is what Michael Charlier referred to recently as he called it the cudgel of obedience, right? That is, he, he says that the, that 
that the, you have a perfect storm when the modernists who were at loggerheads with church authority under Pius X and Pius XII, and to a lesser extent, other popes of the 20th century, when they became in charge or when they had the ear of the people in charge, they then wielded obedience as a weapon by which to punish Catholics faithful to tradition, right? It's a perfect storm. I mean, it's, 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 it's sort of a brilliant strategy of the evil one, right? To take something which is, which, which, uh, St. Benedict calls the bright weapon of obedience, right? He has such a beautiful expression for it. Um, to turn that weapon against Catholicism, against the historic confessional Christian faith, right? Against its, it, the greatest, most ancient liturgical rite of Christendom. It's just a brilliant strategy that could only have come from an angelic intellect. Yes, absolutely. Well, uh, thank God that we do have the the church, when we, when we understand the church as the whole body of the baptized, not just the mm -hmm. clergy, but and also the angels and the saints. Yes, and both. all ages of the church, too. Yes, so yes. we have, that is the church, which is totally indefectible, which is fighting against the powers of darkness and conquering because Christ has already ascended to the Father. So, which we'll celebrate next week. So let's, uh, we'll offer up a Hail Mary and invoke our patrons at 1 Peter 5. So once again, please donate to our spring fundraiser. We do depend on your donations. So please support our fundraiser, 1peter5.com slash donate. So we'll just pray a Hail Mary and our two of our patrons at 1 Peter 5 are Our Lady of Fatima and Emperor Carl. So we'll invoke them and we'll close out. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Blessed Emperor Carl, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen.